So I'd like to introduce my co-host, Winnie Zhang, and our two very special guests, Akanksha Bhatnagar and Ethan Sinak. And so I'll let them say hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Winnie, like Winnie the Pooh. Um, I work on the conference team, so you'll be seeing me around today. Akanksha? Hi, everyone. My name is Akanksha. I use she, her pronouns. I'm calling in from uh, Ottawa, uh, Canada. I was going to say Edmonton because that's where I'm originally from. Um, and I've been on the Open Ed Steering Committee, and this is actually my third time attending as a student. Awesome. Um, hey, everybody. I'm Ethan. I use he, him. I am based in D.C., but I'm from New England originally. Um, and I am an old hat when it comes to open ed, uh, but this is obviously my first virtual one, just like the rest of y'all. So I am excited to be here. Well, we are so happy to have both of you with us today. Um, we're going to talk about, we, we all brought our mugs. So we're going to do our show and tell on our mugs and we'll talk, we're going to talk a little bit about our mugs. Um, and then we'll go through and talk about um, a few things. Um, and Kang, she's going to talk about her student leadership and her Canadian federal advocacy. And Ethan is going to talk about um, how to have hard conversations and how to navigate them. And um, he's going to talk a little bit about his plans for a social event later. So um, we're going to start by showing, we'll all show you our mugs. Um, and I, we're learning how to use the, the webcam. Not sure if you can get a clear picture, but um, I'll start. Mine says, I don't sweat, I sparkle. And this was actually a gift to me from my lovely sister-in-law because she knows that I like to run. And so um, one of the crazy things that I did with, um, with the pandemic is I started running every single day, which is something I never thought that I would be able to do. Um, and so it's, I joined a virtual race and um, the first one I did was the great virtual race across Tennessee and I had to run 635 miles in three months. And um, some of it was walking, some of it was walking, but now I'm doing a circumpolar race around the world. Of course, this is virtual, right? These are all virtual um, where I'm on a I'm on a team with 10 people and together we're going to run 30,000 miles in 18 months. If we do it in 12 wow. months, I know, right? <laughs> if we do it in 12 months, we get a gold medal, but we're just doing it for fun. So, so yes, I sparkle. <laughs> <laughs> Winnie, which mug did you bring today? So I brought a double R diner mug. Uh, my boyfriend is a huge Twin Peaks fan, uh, number one show for him, and uh, he got me to watch all of them when we started dating, so uh, for one year, I surprised him as, for a trip to the actual diner, and then we bought this mug, so it was, it was an awesome experience and a mug that reminds me of an amazing trip. And a shout out to all the 80 children who remember Twin Peaks. <laughs> Akanksha, do you want to tell us about your mug? Sure. So my mug is this little like gold plated elephant mug. So elephants are my absolute favorite animal. I recently got a stick and poke tattoo actually of an elephant that was inspired by this one. Um, but the reason I got it is because I used to work at Starbucks many years ago and they used to do thing called partner discount so every single day you get 30 percent off but there were some days where you got 50 percent off so I bought like every single mug usually that was there so I got this one um there was another one of a giraffe and then there was another one of the map of um, Africa the continent so it was really beautiful and now I just like only wash it very carefully and it's just so hard to go into Starbucks now and not want to get all the mugs but I don't get the discount so it's less exciting <laughs> <laughs> Ethan what about your mug yeah I have so I don't know it, because it's white it's gonna get blotted out but um my mug <laughs> doesn't have much of a story but um we usually do a like white elephant of mugs uh only uh among my friend group here in DC and this was a white elephant mug and it is a rainbow unicorn that says, bitch, I'm fabulous. And hopefully nobody is offended by salty language this early in the morning. And you are fab fabulous, Ethan. So Thank you. <laughs> so it's perfect. <laughs> Absolutely perfect. So um, 
Winnie's going to tell us a little bit about um, Sorry. some things that we're going we're gonna, to um, have today as part of the program. Yeah. So we have a V connecting at tea time at 1.30 EST. So that will be with some plenary speakers. Uh, and then I'm also really excited for a 5.30 to 8.30, a three hour long social programming, if you're up for it, of Dungeons and Dragons. How many conferences do you go to where there's actually a Dungeons and Dragons session? Um, we'll have two DMs. And I'm gonna read off really quickly the storyline that they've set. Uh, so for decades, Ilaria Feywing, known as the master of Merriam Vow, has trained and mentored groups of young adventurers in exploration, magic, and fighting. When you and your friends completed your training and bade Ilaria farewell just three days ago, you didn't know that you would be her final students. She died in her sleep that very night, but she left you a message in her will. It appears she has one more task for you. Okay. They'll be using Roll20 if you want to join and check out the description to get set up beforehand. Awesome. And Winnie, do you know, do you have to be like a veteran um, uh, d and player or can you? They're doing like level one characters um, and they all, I think they'll have some characters available. Uh, if you want to, oh, sorry, if you want to create your own character, you're going to have to sign up for Roll20 as soon as possible but um, they have some pre-made characters ready to go. And it's kind of just imaginative uh, and, and you go with what, so if you have a big imagination, you should definitely, definitely do it. Fun times. Yeah, that sounds like an amazing event. Um, you know, and I, I, I wanted to also recognize that, um, that today is a holiday in, in many countries and we want to recognize those who are honoring this day and also those who have served and who have given their lives. So um, we, we wanted to, 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 to think about this day um, as we're going through our, our, our conference programming. Um, okay, so, so I don't know if y'all heard, um, if you tuned into the late show last night, but it snowed in Denver yesterday. And this is big news for me because I live in Houston where I'm not kidding you. And Winnie too, Winnie's in Houston. It is 80 degrees today. It is hot and humid. And we would have loved to have been in Denver in the snow. So I feel like we're missing out a little bit on, on that part of, of attending open ed. But um, we, we were also chatting a little bit about how wonderful it is that we are virtual. Um, and that it's, it's really created a space for more inclusion and, and a lot more people to participate. And um, so we're, we're grateful for that. Um, and a funny thing happened this morning. A um, couple of us showed up in these red shirts. And then we, uh, we had some quick wardrobe changes. Do any of my, my special guests or co-hosts want to talk about that a little bit? Well, I think essentially we wanted to send a throwdown challenge to the folks on the late show to show up and be in matching uniforms. So that's um, right. You know, <laughs> and it's also, I just think we should take a moment to appreciate that it's not even just all red. It is all the exact same tone. Yeah, of red, exactly. which I think right. is which is it, very challenging to accomplish. So I think we get I think we get major props for that. Yeah. So this is a challenge. I know Emily is here. So this is a challenge for the late show. Come as coordinated as this. All right. <laughs> well, and I also have to say it's 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 been um, a struggle for me. Um, I've been working remotely for six months and I've been using that as an opportunity to wear all of my favorite t-shirts and you know I've been rocking the work mullet where I have my my nice you know I have a, a, a presentable shirt and then I have my sweatpants on um but you know so it's been a little difficult like I don't I forgot like what do you what do you wear to um to work anymore like what do professional clothes look like <laughs> so so uh yeah I'm already out I'm gonna have to figure out something for tomorrow um, okay, well, um, I, I, we would really love to hear from Akanksha. She has a lot to share with us today. So, um. uh, Well, I just wanted to talk quickly about 
like I just think that it's never too early to talk about advocacy and talking about you know things that you can do to better the open movement but like I always say to my friends that advocacy is a lifestyle and so I just wanted to touch on what that kind of looks like and feels like as a student so I mean when I first attended open ed I like did not know about all of the open stuff that was going on I was just like here because this was an affordable option and students were always coming up to me being like, I don't want to pay so much for textbooks. And I was like, I agree. I can't disagree with you. Um, I had run for student government in the role of VP academic. It just literally made sense for me to care about open. And the more I've learned about it, the more I've been genuinely interested about how open can change a lot of the world. Um, so I've been introduced to things like open access and open data. And so now the work I do with the Canadian Alliance of Student Associations, which is a national lobby group for students in Canada, um, is working with uh, formerly the Tri-Council agencies, but now the Canadian Research Granting Agencies on things like open access and trying to find ways that we can actually streamline the process for um, making manuscripts and making um, data more publicly available to people. Uh, for anyone that is Canadian on the call, you'll know that Canada acts in a certain way and then Quebec doesn't share a lot of their data. So that's been really uh, interesting to deal with when it comes to just doing research on a variety of things. Like even if we're doing research on the cost of tuition, for example, those things are actually really difficult to find um, because there isn't people pushing for centralized uh, databases for data or centralized um, areas for universities to publish. So I found it super interesting and I just wanted to know if anybody else had an interest in that and to just reach out. And because I think that, you know, from the Canadian perspective, and I'm sure that uh, Ethan, Winnie and Amy have heard me say this a thousand times is we just don't have organizations like Spark um, or like OpenStax or like any of the above that are, you know, a conglomerate that does open education work. Right now it's a bunch of, provinces doing their own work, eCampus Ontario or BC Campus are doing incredible things. But uh, being from Alberta, we had um, the Alberta funding program, the ABOER program that was funding for just three years. And then it, as soon as things got really great and people were starting to publish work, um, the funding ran out. And then all of that work had just sort of, you know, been put on pause. So I've gained a lot of respect for a lot of the open education work that happens in the States, but trying to find a way in the like um, federal environment in Canada has been really difficult. And I'm just starting to think about what that can actually look like um, now. So I'm honestly just like love talking about advocacy. It is a lifestyle, but I've just been finding it really difficult as a student to find the ways to like really connect it um, on a national scale. And I've learned so much by just being on the open ed steering committee or attending open conferences about how it works. and different states and the countries and I've just found that you know Canada could be so much better than it really is because there's always so many Canadians doing this work but there's no real way to connect them so I've been really lucky to do this work federally um, but also locally at the University of Alberta and that's basically all I want to say was that I feel passionately about this but I'm also frustrated that there's nothing in Canada that's happening at this level especially like now that we have uh, digital learning becoming the number one thing. A lot of people are talking about internet and broadband access, but on top of that, we could also be talking a lot about the world of open and how helpful that could be for not only just universities, but government agencies and, you know, all of the above. Wow, Akangsha, well, you're inspiring to so many of us. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, do you feel that your, um, your work with open ed may have, um, provided some direction for you um, in, in terms of what, where, where you think you're headed next or what you like, would like to do um, when you're, I always say when you finish, like finish in quotation marks, do we ever really leave school? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I absolutely think that open ed has been like one of the most influential things for me to actually understand like how vast the world of open is. Um, and I've made such awesome connections here. So if I'm ever confused or want best practices I often go back to the people that I met at the open ed conferences um, just because it's been just an easy community to get to know and that's one of the first things I noticed was that the community is actually super nice which I mean does it shouldn't be shocking but like it kind of is shocking like I've never gone to a conference 
met people and then actually genuinely kept saying um, that they're like, or genuinely kept talking to them. Um, and so it's been really great to have attended the conference and learn from a lot of people. And I don't think I would, you know, have the concepts I would had it not been uh, attending a lot of weird sessions at open ed, especially last year, I focused on not going to student sessions, not because I wasn't interested, but because I was so curious about how we can frame this for librarians or how we can frame this for faculty members or senior administration um, to be able to use like their own language to them when I go and, you know, talk to them about these things. So, yeah. Wonderful. Um, so there is a question in the chat. Um, I'm not sure if you want to tackle it, but if, if you want to, um, can you discuss how you would interpret um, a, the different if the emphasis between um, open textbook work and OER um, versus OER more aligned with open courses? Um, I think that the biggest differentiation for students is that they only connect it with textbooks because that's the number one problem they're trying to solve. So the problem is that textbooks are too expensive. So the solution is an OER. Um, but I think that the way that we've sort of tried to tackle that is talking about different aspects of open that are a little bit outside of education. So open data is one of those things where people are like, oh, there's actually more to this. So it's kind of like we're showing them one world, showing them another, and then reintroducing them to open courses. Um, which has just been a lot more interesting. And by open courses, I just mean like courses that are run um, not free because I mean, with accreditation and everything, it becomes very complicated, but just with like free course materials and are run in an entirely open um, online manner. So I think that the differentiation like just has to happen because students are specifically connecting things with only one problem that they're seeing because the connection of open courses hasn't necessarily been made to them because they're just like we're just like hardwired to believe that you pay for a course as property or tuition and that's how you get a degree right there's not this like conversation yet about how like money does not equal like a degree to some extent so a lot more complicated of a problem but hopefully that kind of stop it the surface <laughs> Yeah, I think there's definitely that default uh, of thinking, you know, like growing up in public school system, at least in the United States, you use Pearson, McGraw-Hill, these standard textbooks, but they are free. So when you get to college, your assumption is the only text I can get is from those kinds of textbooks. Those are the only ones that exist to me. So it really starts pretty young. And then in college, you're like, well, this is just the norm. Like, I have no idea what does a free textbook even mean? Right, so. Absolutely, and I think, um, I think we might hear a little bit more about that this afternoon in the plenary when we hear from our, um, uh, we, we have a state policy representative and we have an, um, an, an US national um, representative. And I think um, that, that'll be an interesting conversation, right? I think you're right, right? When we talk about an independent school district making a bulk purchase, you know, that, that convert, you know, that, that's part of the conversation, right? Um, how is that different from then, okay, now you're a student and you're on your own and you're responsible for buying your course materials. So, yeah, fantastic. This is all- I'd like to chime in here. Sure, Dan. I'd like to chime in here on that topic um, because one of the things I was going to bring up was um, the issue that K-12 is not really represented at this conference. Uh, very much. I, I searched through the list to see if I could find somebody else that was generally um, uh, generally referenced to um, K-12 and really couldn't find anybody. And so I've been working in this area for many years and primarily in K-12. And I'll just add that textbooks in K-12 are not free. They're, they're really not free at all. They're very expensive. The difference is who pays for them. That's and right. so, and, and for us to have really open thinking about open education, I would suggest that we open our framework to consider a broader, a broader network um, and also to consider the future. So who will be the future students 
in higher ed using open textbooks? And who will be the future teachers in higher ed assigning open textbooks? Well, they're the people that are currently in K-12. So if we want to grow this movement, the place to grow it is not with little niches in graduate programs here and there, it's with K-12. Um, and it's a huge market, but what's different is, and Winnie pointed this out, is the economics of it, that we, we have to address uh, state departments of education and school districts as opposed to the individual purchasing decisions of students. It's a little bigger lift. Um, oh, I can assure you, it's when you try to talk to departments of education, it's a kind of a complicated conversation. On the other hand, it's, it's, it's where we need to be in the future. Um, so I'll, I'll just throw that out there. And by the way, I'll be presenting tomorrow a K-12 solution in, of open education where we actually combine open content, open apps with open source learning management systems. So there is, there is a way to do this. And it, it also yeah. will get at some of those differences between open access and open educational resources. And the way to, the way to really so, get at those, from my opinion, is to apply the five R's to each of them. If you do that, you, you come up with a pretty clear sense of where each belong in their categories. Anyway. So I think this, this would be a great topic, I think, for the Discord, too. Um, I don't see a channel on the K-12, like on for K-12 folks yet. So I think um, this would be a good thing to um, put a channel about in the Discord and we can try to pull together some of the folks that are in the K-12 space and who are here and, and talk about strategy for sure. Yeah, Ethan, um, it's really perfect that you're here today because I know that you also work in the K-12 space. Um, and we have one minute left before we have to let everybody get <laughs> off to concurrent sessions. But I'd also still really like to hear from you and, and your comments on having these very hard and difficult conversations. Yeah, well, I just wanted to share one quick resource for everybody. Um, the you know, we have a lot of sessions these days, uh, sort of challenging uh, hard topics in the open education space, the role of invisible labor, the, um, you know, challenges with building a, uh, you know, inclusive community in the open education space. And I think, you know, some of these conversations can be hard and can be challenging. And so I wanted to just share one quick resource um, that I turn to in, in moments like that where I'm feeling particularly challenged or I know a hard conversation is coming. I just posted it in the chat. Um, it just has a few quick tips. Um, it's particularly around like receiving critical feedback, but I think the tenets of it are, are super applicable um, sort of regardless of whether it's feedback or just a hard session or something like that. And I wanted to share that and encourage everybody to go take a look at it. Thanks, and, and do you want, we're gonna go over just a little bit. Do you wanna um, tell everyone about your social event that you have planned for us this afternoon? Yeah, so I'm really sad to be competing with D&D &D because I would also love to be there. Um, but if anybody is familiar with this like super trending party game called Among Us, um, I'm gonna try to coordinate a bunch of different uh, servers this evening and um, everybody can <laughs> everybody can give it a shot if you are interested. Um, so that'll be during the, the social hour tonight. Well, thank you all so much for being here. I can't believe how quickly our time went by and it's already time to say goodbye and send you off to the concurrent sessions. Um, don't forget that we do have a plenary today at 1 p.m. Central, 
2 p.m. Eastern, and this will be with Harrison Keller, who is the commissioner for the Higher Education, I'm sorry, the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, um, and Sharon Liu, who will be joining us from the U.S. Department of Education. And so we will be talking a lot about policy. Um, and after Maha and Mia's excellent plenary, I know that the bar is very high. So we're, we're super excited to have, um, have these sessions and to have all of you with with us and um, oh, join us tomorrow because there's still so much more we have to talk about. And I hope a lot of you will be able to make Dan's session on K through 12 and, and we can talk about how to have more participation from that space and, and that perspective. So have a great Wednesday and uh, we'll see you all at the late show with Emily Reagan and Haley Babb.